I search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures of faith Are never enough And you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's Better than you, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you And I'm not afraid My failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the valley, mountain, is the God of the valley. And there's not a place where your mercy and grace won't find me again.
beginning One with God the Lord most high Your hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you are Christ What a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Didn't want heaven without us So Jesus, you brought heaven down Sin was great, your love was greater Oh
our praise. Lord, I pray that truly, I pray we've truly blessed you, Father God. Lord, in, in such a sense that this praise has been from our hearts and not just from our lips. Lord, I pray that, that you would really be blessed. And Lord, I pray that you'd be blessed by our lives as well. Not just in the things we sing or say, but Lord, by, by our actions, Lord, by our Christian conduct, Father, I pray that we would bless you. Lord, God, just be blessed. You are our God, and we love you. We thank you for bringing us into your family, for loving us into your kingdom. Hallelujah, God. We praise you, Lord, for who you are. And Lord, right now, God, we, we, we pray for Dwight Walters, Lord. I pray, God, that you would do a miracle in his body, Lord. That you bring rapid healing. God, that he be discharged tomorrow, God. I pray that you touch him today, God. Lord, bring healing, Lord, that this would be a testimony for your glory and your greatness. Lord, remind us, Lord, to pray from this week, I pray, God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 How about taking some time and greeting someone, maybe all the way across the sanctuary this morning, if you would. Oh, you guys are good today. You kind of calmed down and quieted down real quick. Usually, I, I don't want to. I don't want to urge you to stop, but we have to move forward. So, hey, listen. If this is your first time with us this morning, we have these connect cards in the seat back in front of you, where you're seated. Fill that in. If you're first, maybe even second, third time, but if you haven't gotten our gift packet yet, we really want you to have that. So, fill it out. Go to the information desk at the close of service. Turn it in, and they have some goodies for you. We really want you to have, and you can take those home with you. Um, with that, let's go ahead and pray for our offering this morning. Ushers ready? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, again, for your presence here, that we can worship you. And Lord, that we can worship you, again, from our hearts. And we manifest that through our checkbooks, bringing you the tithe, bringing you offerings, worshiping you. Jesus said in himself that wherever our treasure is, our heart's going to be right there. And so, Lord, I pray, God, that we would freely give of our treasure to you, that we'd honor you this morning, and I pray that you'd bless each giver. In Jesus' name, amen. Ah uh -huh. 
Amen. Hallelujah. A couple quick announcements. We've got um, a men's work day. We just had men's breakfast yesterday. We've got a men's work day this coming weekend, Saturday, and um, there is a sign-up sheet. We'd like to know who's coming because the rumor is Pastor Hans is taking care of lunch for us with some cheesesteaks. So um, we want to be able to help everyone who helps us. And unless it's a downpour, I mean, right now, you know, a whole week away and they're forecasting some rain. If it's light rain, we're going to get some things done. So come prepared. Bring tools with you, whatever you think we could possibly need, um, but we need you. So if you'll be with us next Saturday. And then also the Harvest Dinner is coming up. This is a fundraiser for Girls Ministries, a missions fundraiser, not for their own selves, but uh, to help with world missions. And uh, as you know, it's a wonderful chicken dinner and uh, kind of homemade by way of Costco. <laughs> but it's, it's good stuff. It really is good stuff. And uh, $10 for adults, kids are $5, always a good time of fellowship too. So if you haven't ever done it, give it a try. Um, you can sign up until November 1, about a week in advance. I can't believe we're, we're heading towards November. Can you believe it? One more Sunday in this month. Anyways, let's, um, let's uh, take a look. Let's start out this morning by looking at Matthew's gospel. We're going to be, begin by reading from the 18th chapter. And you can read along. Matthew 18, beginning at verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay the Master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this very poignant incident. Lord, such a strong teaching lesson. And Lord, I pray, God, that we would hear your word today. Lord, that, it, that everything else that might be going through our minds right now would be, would be cast aside and that we would hear your word today, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us and prepare us to take action. And so we're not hearers only, but truly doers of your word. And we pray your anointing in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're going to consider something that Jesus said, as we had for probably a few months now, and today's topic is going to be the most challenging for most of us, I think. It's, and I say that from personal experience as well as from what we just read. In fact, you can see it right in the very first verse that we read. Peter wants to get technical with the topic of forgiveness. That's what we're talking about today, the topic of forgiveness. And truth be told, you know what? It's easier to talk about forgiveness than it is to practice it. Amen. I mean, look at Peter's inquiry, verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and he asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. And and just, you know, just think about this for a moment. Think about this very moment. Think about this, this question. Why would Peter even ask such a question? Is he looking for a limit? Is he looking for boundaries? Could it be that he has been hurt enough and injured and offended so many times in life that he really wants to know where the cutoff is? 
Why is this so important to Peter? Of all the things that we can read about in the Gospels, why is this of such importance to this man, Peter? And I will say this, the fact that Peter asked this question, I believe implies that you and I, included with him, are oftentimes hurt, that, we, that we're hurt and offended regularly by other people. I mean, real or perceived, there are, there, there are a lot of barbs that come our way on a weekly and daily basis. And, and let me suggest to you, too, that I believe that most are perceived and not intentional. The offenses that you feel, I said, are not intentional. I really believe that the average person does not wake up in the morning and think, hmm, who can I hurt today? Who, I mean, really, they don't intentionally look for opportunities to offend people. The average, now, there are people who will do that, but the normal average person doesn't begin their day plotting and scheming about who they can hurt, who they can inflict with pain. And yet we can, of course, hurt people with our actions and our behavior. Amen? I mean, we can physically hurt people, but I know the most common manner in, in, in which we offend is with our mouths. And I believe that it's usually accidental. I believe that it's usually accidental. And for this reason, I'm so thankful for James chapter 3 and verse 2. Look at this verse. This is incredible. We all stumble. We all, all, every one of us, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. Able to keep their whole body in check. Isn't that incredible? Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. I mean, what honesty, what candidness. We all stumble. That, that means you as well as me. Anyone who's perfect in their speech is a perfect person. Now, let me ask you a rhetorical question. Have you ever met a perfect person? Are you perfect in your speech? And get this, I'm a pastor, and part of what I do is what I'm doing right now, and that's preaching. And notice, I get to use my mouth and words a couple times each week. And within any given sermon that I might preach, I might not be perfect in my word choice, or my use of illustrations, or in the way that I phrase something. And everybody said, amen. I mean, it happens. Or you might even, listen, you might even hear something that I didn't even say. Did you hear that one? You might hear something that I never said. And I've had plenty of times over the past 45 years where I was accused of saying something that I did not say. And I am so thankful that our services are recorded. <laughs> because the reality is that you may have misunderstood me. You may misunderstood what I said. You might actually leave a church service imagining that I owe you an apology. But you know, this, this can happen anywhere. It can happen where you work. This can happen between friends and, of course, most likely in marriage and family situations. Very simply, you said something and it was intended one way but it was received another way. Can I get some amens on that one? And working on this message, you know, it reminded me, this is so sad, it reminded me of a lost year of a very dear friendship when I was a boy. I was probably in the fifth grade. And somehow my best friend, my very best friend growing up, somehow we had parted ways over something that one of us had done or had said. I got to admit, I don't know which one of us had done or said something that offended the other, but I, I don't know what it was, but, but for about an entire year, and we lived across the street from each other, we did not play together. We did not acknowledge each other's existence. We walked to the school bus yard lengths behind each other. If he, if he started down the street before me, I just waited. I wanted enough space, some social distancing. And if I was out before him, it was the same thing. You, he'd be, you could see he'd be peeking out his window waiting to see, you know. And even during that year, 
we both lost track of what had alienated us from each other. In other words, very simply, we were both mad at each other, but we had both completely forgotten why. Until one day, and this I do remember, it was fall. It was about this time of year, and we had both been consigned to rake leaves for our parents. And so I'm raking leaves in my front yard. He's raking leaves in his front yard. And I know, you know, underneath it all, we're snarling at each other. You know, just can't stand you, you idiot. And I thought, I wondered in the middle of that. I just wondered. Because you have a lot of time to think when you're raking leaves. You know, with a rake, you know, like the way people used to do it. And I'm just thinking... I'm raking leaves. He's raking leaves. Why aren't we friends? You know, what went wrong? And I realized I didn't know. I couldn't remember. I had no idea. Why are we not talking? Why are we not socializing with each other? And I could not remember. And so I thought, you know what? This is stupid. This is just plain stupid. So I threw my rake down, walked across the street, not knowing how I was going to be received, not knowing if if this was going to actually reconcile or not, but I was going to do my very best to restore that friendship that day. We'd wasted enough time on anger and alienation. And you know what? It worked. It worked. And you know what? He didn't remember either. He didn't remember why we were mad at each other. And the reality is, the sad reality is that the two of us missed out on an entire year of fun together. And never mind missing out on all the good things. Worse than that, we carried a huge weight of disdain for no reason at all. Now, this is a story about two boys. Okay, one year. It really was just about a year. Two boys. But you know, in marriage, it can lead to divorce. In churches, this leads people who will leave a good sheepfold like ours and wander from church to church the rest of their Christian life, never settling down, never feeling at home in their spiritual setting, all because someone hurt them or they perceived that someone hurt them. And that is so sad. That is so unnecessary. I mean, I I once had someone years ago right here leave this church. And I called him to find out why. It had been a couple weeks, two, three weeks, and I hadn't seen him. And, 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 I, I told, and, and they, they told me that someone in our church on a Sunday morning suggested to them that they were sitting in their preferred spot and asked them to move. Someone, I don't, you know, and I, I, just, I told the story to our young adults Sunday school class this morning, but I, I said it was, it was probably one of our old regulars or something, but I really don't know that for a fact. I got to take that back. But anyway, someone, hopefully it wasn't one of our, you know, solid core people here at Praise, but someone went up to him one Sunday, and this guy had been attending here for about a year or two. Someone went up to him and said, you're in my seat. (laughs) I I really, I didn't know if I should believe him when he told me that over the phone. It's just, you got to be kidding me. Now, first of all, whoever asked them to move was rude. I, I agree. But on the other hand, they only asked him to move. They didn't ask him to leave the church or to sit outside. You know, so I mean, what I'm saying is both people were in the wrong. Okay, if anyone ever comes up to you, I'm just going to lay it out there. If someone comes up to you next week and says, hey, you're in my seat. Tell them what I told my, I'm, tell them what I told my young adults class this morning. Um, there's an empty seat right in front. Or I'll move down. But you really want to get them ticked? Just move just close enough so you're still sitting right next to them. Because <laughs> you don't own the whole row. And I don't think any of you have bought one of these seats individually. There's no plaques on the back of these seats. This isn't colonial America where your family owned a pew. Okay? I mean, how petty for someone to do that. I was really insulted. And there's no way for me to verify this. So whether it was perceived or real, I don't know. But anyways, let's go back to this passage. So Peter asks, is seven times enough? And remember now, the number seven is the number of perfection for the Jew. And Jesus says, no, no, it's not enough. You need to forgive seven times 70, which equals 490. That's not what Jesus is trying to convey either. 
He says you need to forgive basically every time. You need to forgive each time. And it goes without saying that that's a tall order. That's a very hard thing to do, to forgive over and over again. And I do want to say this on this, on this topic. If someone has needed your forgiveness repeatedly, listen to me. If someone needs your forgiveness repeatedly on the same issue over and over again, then let me suggest that you should forgive them one more time. And then put yourself in a position where you will not have to forgive them again. Hear me? If you have to keep forgiving them for the same thing, then you make sure, again, you need to forgive them one more time and then move forward. Don't put, don't put yourself, don't set yourself up for the same need to forgive them again. If they're borrowing money and don't repay, forgive them, but don't loan to them again. If they're verbally abusive, you have to forgive them. But you do eventually have to address the issue. And you need to do whatever it takes to make sure it stops. Amen? You see, Jesus is not suggesting that we put up with any kind of abuse over and over again. Not at all. He says, every time you're offended, you need to forgive. But you don't have to set yourself up for, this, for a repeat every day. You don't have to do that. You know, it's almost like the worldly axiom that we've all heard. You know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Being forgiving does not mean being naive or being gullible or being stupidly vulnerable. I think there's a place to be vulnerable, but you, I think you can go to excess on this. So again, back to Matthew 18, Jesus tells a rather lengthy parable here, right? About two men in debt. One is indebted to the king for a huge sum of money. I forget how many bags of gold. The debtor begs for mercy. He receives mercy. But then the same debtor who receives a huge amount of forgiveness goes to someone who owes him just a few pieces of silver, a small debt, and he's harsh with him. And so when the king finds out, he revokes the mercy on the first man. And then Jesus says in verse 35, this is how my heavenly father will treat each one of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from the heart. And of course, so often in scripture, we see how Jesus, Jesus had an unbelievable way of putting things in perspective. And that's what he's doing here in this passage. He started out telling the story. He said, the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like, and then he told this story. It's like a king who granted great forgiveness. And because he's willing to forgive you of a huge debt and me of a huge debt, then we need to learn to forgive others. And all those who might owe us much, much less. I mean, I, I just have to believe, according to God's word, that the greatest debt that could ever, that could ever be issued is a man... A man, God, who died in my place so that I get to live forever in heaven. That's a huge debt. There was no way for us to pay that way. There was no way for us to get out of that. He paid this supreme debt. And any other debt that, that someone owes us compared to that is nothing. And it's really that simple. Well, technically it's that simple. But as with Peter, it's harder, it's harder to practice. Again, forgiveness, when we analyze the prospect of having to forgive someone, can seem really hard. It really can. Depends on what the offense is, but it can seem really hard. It's almost as though when we offer forgiveness to someone, we can feel as though we're twice a loser. Okay, they used us once, they abused us once, and now we're going to say, no problem, you're forgiven. Oh, it just, it's like it hurts twice. It's almost like you, in our minds, we imagine that it's going to sting twice. That we're going to become somewhat less of a person. But you know the reality is, according to the word, and if you've ever practiced real forgiveness, you know this by experience. In reality, forgiveness, which again looks prematurely, it looks painful as, the, as painful as the offense, it's actually liberating. Forgiveness is actually liberating. That's why Jesus is prescribing it here. Lewis Smedes, he wrote a lot about the topic of forgiveness. I want you to listen to a couple quotations by this author. He says, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. That's powerful. He also wrote this. He said, forgiving does not erase the bitter past. He says, a healed memory is not a deleted memory. 
Instead, forgiving what we cannot forget creates a new way to remember. We change the memory of our past into the hope for our future. Isn't that great? A healed memory is not a deleted memory. If someone has hurt you and you forgive them, it doesn't, it doesn't erase the hurt. It frees you. But again, you, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. You don't delete the event. You bring healing to the event. And in many cases, that relationship where the hurt, where the offense was, can be healed and even improved over time. It doesn't have to end there. You remember how Jesus told us to travel through life with as light a burden as possible? Then he said, take this yoke. Well, let, let, let's, look, let's look at what he said. Matthew 11, verse 28. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Okay, and you can be weary and burdened by anything. Just think about the need to forgive someone. Someone has hurt you in some way. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Carrying unforgiveness is an unnecessary burden. I said it's an unnecessary burden. He forgave, so we also have to forgive. And, and listen to what he said as they were crucifying him, okay? You know, they had already humiliated him. They ridiculed him. They beat him, our Savior. And in Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Here's a man condemned to death, crucifixion on a cross. And it's not enough to humiliate him and beat him. They're going to they're gonna take his clothes and divide him up and go home? Talk about perspective. They were brutal with Jesus, merciless, insulting. They were killing him, and yet he asked for his heavenly father to forgive them. I want to share with you four different graphics that each speak to the issue of unforgiveness. Let's go ahead and take a look at these. Unforgiveness is a prison we create that forces us to keep feeling the pain of the past. Isn't that true? Just have to keep reliving it. Let's go to the next one. When thoughts of offense they lose your mind, know that Satan is setting a trap for you. Don't take his bait. Because you'll sit there and you'll suffer with that unnecessary burden. Next slide. The sooner you let go of what they did, the quicker you can embrace what God is doing. Hallelujah. Isn't that a good one? You've got to let go of it so God can do something in your life. And then the last one, finally. The most influential person in your life is the one you refuse to forgive. I don't want anyone influencing my life to that degree. Can you imagine? The most influential person in your life is the one you refuse to forgive, to let go. And let me also give you some verses that tell us why we should be willing to forgive. Right from the word, these are all from Paul's epistles. Colossians 2.13 says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. How? He forgave all our sins. He forgave all our sins. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. 2 Corinthians 13.11, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. And remember, this is a church where these people were constantly picking at each other. They were comparing each other. They were always, they're, they're going, they're, they're, they're bringing people to the courts. They were suing each other. And in the second letter, Paul says, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And then finally, Colossians 3.13, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. You see, forgiveness is a big deal to God. We once had a broken relationship with our creator father. We were, and we were the ones who damaged the relationship. You're related to Adam and Eve, like it or not. Mankind was the perpetrator of that violation, that first sin. We were the ones who damaged that relationship. And then God sends his son here 
to repair this damaged relationship. I mean, Jesus did everything necessary to make it right. And really, think about this with me. He did it all. He did it all. I mean, born according to the Old Testament prophecies. He lived among men without sin. No sin in his life, his entire lifetime in this earth. He had 12 disciples that he, that he trained and taught and, and he spoke as we have seen in this series. Jesus said, he said so much about how to live our lives. And then he allowed himself to be killed. To be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Crucified on a cross. He died so that you and I could be forgiven. He did it all. He did it all. And what does he want from us? What does he want from any human being? Just that each one would say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for my, for my sinful condition. That's all. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't ask us to do pilgrimages. He doesn't ask us to do anything sacrificial. All he wants us to do is say, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Isn't that how you get saved? Believing in your heart, confessing with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord. He did it all, and we have only one simple thing to do. That's what I mean by forgiveness is a big thing to God. And because he set that example, we also have to be willing to practice forgiveness. Listen to what Jesus said a dozen chapters before the passage we looked at today. This is in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. Jesus said, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And you know what? I wouldn't believe that except it's in print. It it really does. It seems rather stern. Forgiveness is a big deal to God. He wants good relationships. He He wants the right relationship between you and I. And then he wants us to have good relationships with each other. Amen. If you do not forgive others, he said, your father will not forgive your sins. Let's pray. I want us to spend some time at the altar this morning. You you know, maybe, maybe this isn't something you need right now. But because we're humans, we're going to need it at some time. Because we're going to offend someone. It could, it might be with words, you know, it could just be a look (laughs) that got misinterpreted. It could, it could just be someone misunderstanding what you said. They didn't hear everything you said and they walked away before you finished. It could be, you you know, all the things that you get offended by. And yet he's called us to live together as the church. And so I know that at some point we have to forgive. We have to learn to forgive. We have to practice forgiveness. This was Peter's concern. How many times do I have to forgive? Really bothered Peter. And when I think about Peter, it's like he's the one that had to be forgiven. Because of the sins of Adam and Eve, but even his own, Jesus even told him, you're going to deny me three times and then the rooster is going to crow. Peter failed. And yet Jesus restored him. He finally restored him when he When he spent some time with Peter and he he said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, I love you. And he asked him again three times. Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? And Peter said, yes. And that brought full restoration between those two. And Peter Peter became a different kind of man, different kind of believer. What about your walk with God right now? Where are you with Jesus? Do you know him as your Savior? With heads bowed and eyes closed, do you know him as your Savior? If not, you can ask him to come into your heart, into your life, forgive you of all your sins, total reconciliation, and you can, you can, you can make him your Lord. He wants to be. He wants to forgive us of all of our sin. 
Is there anyone here this morning say, Pastor, I don't have Jesus living in my heart. I'm not born again, but I want to be born again. If that's you, would you just raise your hand where you're seated this morning? It's really that simple. He did it all. All we have to do is say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. I want you to be my Lord, and he'll come into you, and he'll live with you forever. Is there even one here this morning? Then if not, let's think about all of our relationships. For every one of us, begin with Jesus. Are, are you right where you should be with him? I mean, I'm not talking perfection. There's no one perfect. We already decided that today. There's no one perfect. But is there a need to improve that relationship? Is there something that you need to get rid of, some kind of burden? Or maybe you've been at odds with a family member or someone at work or maybe a classmate. It doesn't, you know, maybe he were church. I want to open this altar to you in a moment and just find a place of prayer. We're not going to labor over this, but just simply, Lord, I, just, I want you to leave that burden here before you leave this building. So let's all stand together and let's make that move. Let's just find a place of prayer here this morning before we go. And as people are coming, Lord, I just pray, God, that you would, God, just empty our hearts. Lord, of every unnecessary burden, burdens with relationships, because that's where all the forgiveness has to, has to deal with this. Lord, Lord, just our, our relationship with you, Lord, I pray that it would be better. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness right now in our walk with you. God, maybe we've cooled off. Maybe we've gotten a little bit distant. Maybe we've gotten a little bit careless. But Lord, we want, we want to be 100% right with you. And we'll need it again tomorrow. So Lord, we just ask your forgiveness, Lord. Forgive us for, for iniquity, Lord. Forgiveness of, of any sin at all in our lives, Lord. God, I pray that you just purge it out of us. And Lord, if, if, if there be people here today that are carrying a grudge, they're carrying unforgiveness, Lord, I pray that they would not leave here with that burden. You want us, Lord, to be in relationship with each other. You have put the church together. Your word says in 1 Corinthians 12, 18, that you put all the members together as it pleases you. You've decided who's to make up your church family on a local basis. And so, Lord, I pray that, that we'd be able to, to have good relations with each other. That there be no hindrance, no, no unnecessary bondage or burden. We ask, Lord, for you to work in our lives, Lord. And God, help us understand that none of us will ever be perfect in everything we say. There's no one. There's no one who can do that. And so, Lord, help us to not be easily offended, whether it be by perception or by reality. I thank you, Lord, for your grace, your grace that forgives us and gives us the ability to forgive those who trespass against us. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for this moment. Thank you, Lord, for this moment. Because, Lord Jesus, this is what you said. Hallelujah. Let's all stand together. Hallelujah. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for this assembly, Lord, for this church body. And Lord, I just thank you for the, for the degree of love in this room. Lord, that we can enjoy each other just as we enjoy you. Lord, continue to work in our lives, Lord. Continue to speak to us about the word we've heard today. And I pray now as we leave that you'd bless each one in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.